National School Choice Week is a celebration of charters, private, public, and even online education for kids and their parents across the United States. As a part of the celebration, Reason TV's Editor-in-Chief Nick Gillespie and Reason Foundation's Director of Education and Child Welfare, Lisa Snell, gave a talk at our Los Angeles headquarters calling bullshit on public education abuses. You know, the basic idea of why we need school choice is the context is that our current system is failing parents, it's failing taxpayers, and especially it's failing students. Uh, it's filled with abuses, with waste, with misdirected attention and just kind of stupid motions that aren't helping anybody. And one of the things that reason that we particularly are interested in uh, talking about is that it's out of step with what at Reason Magazine and on Reason.com in our videos, Reason TV videos, we talk about as the libertarian moment, which uh, we, we say is a turn to hyper-personalized and individualized goods and services in everything in our lives except for a few places. Education is one of them. Healthcare is one of them. Retirement is one of them. The problem in a nutshell is that going back to say 1970, and you could, you could you know, go back a little bit less or a little bit longer, the trend is the same. We have seen again and again the cost in inflation adjusted terms to educate somebody from K through 12 has gone up from in 1970 uh, in current dollars, it cost about $57,000 for all those years of education, for 13 years of education per student. It currently costs, or in, in 2010, it costs $164,000 in, in inflation-adjusted terms. And these lines down here are um, assessments uh, that have been constant over that same period for graduating high school seniors. They are flat or slightly declining. Um, so we are essentially paying about two and a half times more for th the same product. And one thing to know, uh, or one thing to think about is how awful, so, like there isn't another thing in your life probably where you are getting a 1970 quality good or service for two and a half times uh, what it was. We said we're calling bullshit on, on abuses in public education. You can fill, you know, endless days, just every day in the newspaper there are uh, ridiculous stories. Here are some case studies and you know, abuses of, of students or of, of the educational system. So one of them, uh, which we did a video about, uh, Buffalo teachers got $9 million in taxpayer purchased plastic surgery in 2009. Uh, and it was five million, it went down to $5 million in 2012. They're trying to phase out the problem. But this is amazing and it's part of their union contract. Detroit teachers called a sick out uh, over building conditions <laughs> despite they have a per pupil spending of in the Detroit school district of $18,000 per student they got because of the the problems with their buildings they got a $7,500 grant this year to add per student and yet $4,400 of that is going to go to debt service and retirees so they're still not going to be able to actually adequately repair and maintain their their physical plant for 18 grand a year per student plus new things this is a picture from a school, a uh, middle school, I believe, in, uh, in Detroit, where kids are playing indoors because the, neither the gym, the hallways, because the gym and the playgrounds aren't functional. Uh, you know, this is just, it's abuse. There's no way around it. An 11-year-old uh, was suspended for bring he, he was supposed to bring a, a plant into school, like a leaf for a project. He brought in this picture down here, uh, which hopefully uh, those of you who are conversant will recognize that this is not a pot leaf. It's a Japanese maple leaf. He brought it in. He was an honor student, uh, which may not mean much because everybody's an honor student these days. But um, it was mistaken for pot. The school district tested it, and they still, you know, and they found that it was not a pot leaf. But they still suspended him for a year. His parents had to fight at, uh, to get him back in the school, and there's an ongoing court case which has not yet been. Uh, uh, adjudicated fully. Uh, mandatory drug tests for choir and academic challenge honor students. This is a Supreme Court uh, case that was settled in 2002 which legalized or, or uh, finally said, yeah, you know what, schools can, as a condition of taking part in extracurricular activities, and Antonin Scalia was one of the, the, the most forceful uh, writers of the majority opinion or a concurrent opinion, saying, yeah, you know what, schools have an absolute right to force kids who want to do extracurricular activities to submit to mandatory drug tests. Uh, even though statistically, and they all, you know, everybody acknowledged this was true, if you do extracurricular activities, you're less likely than the average student to take drugs or drink. But 
it's still this is a condition. Uh, the girl who uh, who uh, you know brought this case ultimately, or was in her name Earls. Uh, she was an honor student who was in uh, you know in the choir and uh, had never had a problem, never tested positive for anything. Um, and uh, an academic challenge, which is like a quiz show. It's like Jeopardy. It's a, the ultimate nerd sport. But she has to, uh, and, and uh, this is still going on. My, uh, I have a son who goes to high school in Ohio, and we just got uh, word, because he does sports, you know, you have to submit to man, uh, you know, mandatory random drug tests. Uh, it's horrible. And then finally, uh, just to kind of run through these quickly, there's the great pop top. Pop Tart freak out of 2013 in Maryland, uh, which resulted in a suspension, counseling, reinstatement, and then a sad new law in Florida, uh, which we'll get to in a second. But uh, some of you might have followed this case. A kid at, at uh, lunch, uh, it, he chewed his gun. This is, a, uh, this is an artist rendition. He did not do such a good job. Yeah. But he had a Pop Tart. He had a Pop Tart that he made into a gun by eating part of it. And then he was like going bang, bang to kids at the table. So he got kicked out. It took forever for him to get reinstated. Then Florida legislators actually passed this law in 2014, which among other things says that uh, you won't get in trouble for simulating a firearm or weapon while playing, uh, including brandishing a partially consumed pastry or other food <laughs> item to simulate a firearm or welcome. And that's just sad, isn't it? So. Before we continue, I'm going to ask for, uh, please show which one is your favorite by clapping. Which is your favorite abuse? So we have some audience participation. Is it uh, Buffalo teachers get plastic surgery? Is that your great outrage? Okay. Detroit public schools can't maintain buildings? Okay, not a lot of fans for that one. Uh, Virginia kid uh, suspended for Japanese maple leaf. Okay, some of that. Drug tests for choir girls? Not a lot. And assaults with uh, deadly be breakfast pastries. All right. Seems so like that, uh, it's good. That did well, if not absolutely won. And I want to talk a little bit more about Pop Tarts before I turn it over to, uh, to Lisa to talk about education. And the reason why I talk about Pop Tarts is because this is to get to that idea about the libertarian moment or about the pro profusion of choices in, in our lives that matter. They allow us to be who we are, man. Uh, Ludwig von Mises once said, uh, the great Austrian economist said that man is the choosing animal. Uh, and you know, more choices, it, it's, it's better. The more choice, the better uh, in all sorts of things. And I like to use Pop-Tarts as a, uh, a kind of a metaphor for what's happened in America over the past 40 or 50 years in particular. In 1964, Pop-Tarts were produced by Kellogg or were introduced to, by Kellogg it was a joke on pop art, which was popular at the time. People like uh, uh, Ray Lichtenstein, Roy Lichtenstein and uh, Andy Warhol and whatnot. Um, there were four flavors originally, uh, blueberry, strawberry, brown sugar, cinnamon, and apple currant, which faded pretty quickly. But they all looked the same, and they, you know, they pretty much tasted the same. And what has happened to Pop-Tarts over the past 50 years, 45, 50 years, is that they have grown into you know endless variations and mutations. This is what's happening to our in our lives every day, which is a good thing. Um, currently there's something like, you know, at any given time there's about three dozen Pop Tart varieties on your grocery shelves. How many of you have kids or how many of you eat Pop Tarts on a regular basis? Okay, a few. Um, if you go down the aisle with Pop Tarts, you'll see all different types and like where, you know, it used to be America was much more like this where you know, you know, there, were, there was very little variation. We talked about little variation. Maybe there were, there were whites and blacks, and that was about it. But you know, we, didn't, we didn't talk a lot about difference. We didn't look a lot different. Now we're much more like the Pop-Tart world, where there are more and more varieties of every, in everything that you care about, whether it's people, whether it's about goods, whether it's about services. Uh, and Pop-Tarts are a great, great way to talk about how change is happening in America, how there is more choice, how there is more kind of independence and individualization of everything. A couple of years ago in 2010, Pop-Tarts, uh, Kellogg put a, a pop-up store in, um, in Times Square in New York, and, and the, the big draw there was a thing called the Pop-Tart Varietizer, where it allowed you to personalize your own Pop-Tart. And that's kind of like a nice thing. When you think about your work life, 
is radically different than your parents' or your grandparents' work life. You probably set your own hours to some degree, or certainly more than you might have, or your ancestors might have in the past, uh, which is a good thing. Even Pop-Tart. Pop-Tart celebrates freedom of choice, which is always a good thing. And so, you know, this is a way of thinking about our world. What is good about our world, or what is best about our world, and what we strive for is a world that allows people to individualize and customize their lives to the way they want it to be. Uh, and so here's just a quick examples of stuff. Um, up here in the corner, uh, before he was a, uh, known as a uh, sexual uh, a sex addict, Tiger Woods was, once upon a time, was a very good golfer. Um, what was interesting in the 90s when he emerged, he called himself a Cablinasian because he, uh, he, he said he didn't fit into existing categories and he was part Caucasian, black, Indian, and Asian. He was a Cablinasian. And that's also a metaphor for who we are in America. We think about ourselves in much more complicated, sophisticated, nuanced terms. When Amazon came online in 1995, it revolutionized not just the way we buy books, but the way we think about books. Um, I grew up in New Jersey in, in the 70s and 80s, and the nearest bookstore was miles away, and it, it was smaller than this room. Uh, it had you know, virtually no choice. The library was a little bit better, but there were always like people who were your neighbors who would look at what you were checking out. Amazon not only gave us that anonymity, but it also allowed us to get any book we wanted. Uh, and then used books came online, and suddenly, even if you lived in the middle of nowhere, and I've lived in a lot of small towns as an adult, you could get anything you wanted. It was you know, personalized, individualized. They give you re uh, suggestions. Uh, this is the, uh, have any of you done 23andMe? Do you know? Okay, so this is a cheap $100 DNA test you can do. You can find your genetic uh, code, your genetic sequence. It's the ultimate, like, who you are, 23andMe, also is at the forefront of kind of super individualized medicine uh, in the future, and this is already happening, and it's an incredibly exciting and liberating and, and wonderful the idea where you will, you know, in, within uh, the next 10 years, we will be taking drugs that are matched to our own genetics in order to be more effective because some drugs work on some people and they don't work on others, and we're starting to build towards individualized medicine. Uber is the service that is everybody's private driver. How many of you have used Uber? You know, it's, it's phenomenal, right? I mean, it's, not only does it stop you from driving drunk, it stops other people from driving drunk, uh, and you can get to wherever you are. Uh, particularly, you know, in places, I lived in LA for uh, three years, and LA has a terrible taxi system. Uh, it's, it's really, you know, there aren't cabs, you can't hail them from the street. Uber is a total game changer, and then especially in smaller cities. It, but it's private, personalized uh, service. Uh, this thing in the uh, middle here is from Shapeways, which is a 3D printing company. You can go online and you can get you can you can get a bust of yourself. You can send them photos and get a 3D rendered bust of yourself or of you know your husband, your wife, your kids, or whatever. You can personalize. I mean, it, it's just amazing. And like, and then that's Facebook, which now has uh, something on the order of 50 different gender designations, uh, where we went from. 50 years ago, we talked about men and women, or we talked about male and female. Uh, and you know, now we're in an age where things are just exploding and proliferating. And that is, you know, to bring it back to school choice and, and this concept of the libertarian moment. The libertarian moment, broadly speaking, is, uh, and this is from an article I wrote with Matt Welch, my uh, colleague and co-author, the editor-in-chief of Reason Magazine. The libertarian moment is a time of increasingly hyper-individualized, hyper-expanded choice over every aspect of our lives. It's a, uh, it's a world where it's more possible than ever to live your life on your own terms. It's, and it's not perfect, but it's better than, than the status quo. Uh, it is uh, never before has it been easier for more individuals to chart their own course and steer their lives by the stars as they see the sky, except in certain places. And one of those places, which is both where it's the most glaring and the most important, is education. The traditional you know, residential assignment public school system is expensive and it is delivering terrible results. And that's bad if you're a taxpayer, it's bad if you're a parent, and it's really bad if you're a kid, you know, who is bored or worse in the school that you get sent to. And now I'm going to turn it over to Lisa, who's going to talk about the contours of that and also how to fix it. Let's just start with the Robert F. Kennedy Community School. 
which was built on the site of the old Ambassador Hotel. And it cost $578 million. And I was talking to Nick earlier, and he was telling me about in his town, the, you know, he was complaining because it cost $12 million or $15 yeah. million dollars that they had to build a new high school when there was nothing wrong with the old high school. Well, in LA Unified, they've had a few different multi-billion dollar bonds to build new schools. And now the problem is they're having a difficult time finding kids to actually fill those schools. But the Robert F. Kennedy Community School actually goes with the theory that if you build it, kids will learn, right? So if you have lots of extras and the kids feel safe and they feel like it's a good space that they'll learn. Turns out not so much. That's not necessarily true. This is the teacher's lounge at the school and then that is the theater at the school. And they also have, I think, sound rooms for professional musicians and they have um, kitchens for kids to cook in that rival the Food Network. And lots of cool stuff, really cool stuff at the school. Basically, in California, we had what was called an academic performance index, which aggregated both test scores and other measures. That, And the bottom line is you want your academic performance to move up, not down, to be going into positive numbers. And so you can see that most of these brand new schools that were in this building, their first couple years of testing, they had scores that were going down. The only exception is the new Open World Academy, and that, I think, was the only elementary school. And the elementary school was doing pretty, pretty well. So $629 billion, and I'm actually going to give a shout out to my colleague, Aaron Smith, because I took and borrowed a few of his slides from a presentation that he did. And um, 314 million people, 67% of them could be arguably 15 to 65, keep going. And then, so we each are paying $3,000 for public education, if you count every possible person that could be working. And so basically, between the 70, and this is another way, costs have gone up 131%. I mean, we can say this many ways. The costs are going up, the quality has stayed the same. This is from the Cato Institute. Andrew Coulson actually wrote like one of the best books in on market education. And then here, this is, an interesting slide because this is federal education spending. And you can see that federal education spending has also gone way up, not just regular spending. And again, everything is flat. Um, if you look at how much money do we spend compared to other countries, we're at the very top with Switzerland spending the most money. And the OECD actually did an in interesting study where, and you can keep going, where they looked at how did student achievement do compared to how much you spend? And so what they found is countries, high spending countries like the United States, basically pre performed about the same as countries that spent 50% of what we spend. And so here's an example of that, where the United States is spending upwards of $12,000 per student on average. And here are our performance. Um, this is 2012 reading and math. And this is against other countries where our kids rank. And then you look at Estonia that spends considerably less, half of what we spend, and they're actually scoring higher than us on these international exams. And then the LA school district, LA, the, um, there was just an article out that basically is claiming that they will be broke by 2020 unless drastic st steps are made. And they just actually have had a lot of turmoil, obviously in LA Unified, that some of the local people you may have read about they just got a new superintendent. There is a plan in Los Angeles to um, basically increase the number of charter schools in the um, district. But even without increasing the number of charter schools, you can see that since 2002, LA Unified has lost almost 200,000 kids. And so that's a lot of money at the same time that they were opening brand new schools and building schools. And some of those kids moved out of the city like other urban areas, but a lot of them moved to charter schools. And so the charter schools on average in LA, their performance, whether it's graduation rates or sending kids to college or actual student achievement scores, especially for the most difficult and intractable high school students, which it's always hard to get improvement with high school students because 
you know, they want to not study and they'd rather play video games and watch Netflix. I have a 17-year-old and a 19-year-old, so I know how it goes. But the Broad Foundation proposed a secret plan that got leaked to the press and then got a lot of news coverage where they would spend money to put half of LA Unified students in charter schools. And then you can see here's, they, they've had a lot of protests about charter schools in Los Angeles and at the Baudry building um, where out the district, there's like a tall building with like 40,000 adults that don't go to schools that actually work in the building and they have a lot of protests in front of that building and they're always protesting this charter school expansion. This is where I wanted to just kind of get into like the expansion of school choice in general. Right now we have 59 school choice programs that involve private school choice in the country. So 10 years ago when I was doing this, basically there was one voucher program in Milwaukee. And so, you know, that's considerable growth. And these include all kinds of different school choice programs, voucher programs, tax credit programs, um, where you can actually have education contributions, where you get the money based on your own tax deductions, education savings accounts. So we have a huge spectrum. And what I like to say is Marshall Fritz really advocated for the separation of church, school, and state. Sorry, not church and state, school and state. And, you know, he had a group where he really believed that homeschooling and private paying and taking full responsibility and if we think of like the pure libertarian moment, we would have a pure market-based education system where everyone took care of their own kids. Problem with that is the reality is that we have that $600 billion in spending that we already spend on public education. And you know, as much as we wish that there was some switch that we could flip that everyone would be in a choice based and everyone would take responsibility for their kids, that's not the system that we have. And so then we have a continuum of different kinds of school choice programs that are more or less regulated by the government. And so that includes things like in the middle, charter schools, where schools actually have contracts with um, the government to run schools, and they have certain kinds of fiscal and academic responsibility. This is kind of a map by the Friedman Foundation, which they're big supporters of school choice and they've marked kind of where these different kinds of programs are. A lot of libertarians really like tax credit programs where either corporations or individuals take a direct tax credit and then they fund scholarships for kids to get go to private schools and they feel like that's a little bit less involvement. And then on the very far end of the spectrum, we actually have been working at the Reason Foundation on an idea of public school choice that we call backpack funding or money following the child. And that would be more like what, how you would think of higher education. Right now, you get in the, whether you go to a public or a private college, you can take your financial aid or your parents' money with you. And nobody thinks about you having to be residentially assigned. I mean, everyone is competing. State schools and public schools like UC Berkeley are competing down the street with private schools like Stanford. And we think that is totally normal. But in public education, we've accepted the idea that where you live, largely still, determines where you go to school. And people have normalized the idea that you have to be residentially assigned. And so then what happens is people that can choose with their real estate choices and can afford to go to maybe not the best school in America, but a relatively good school, they use their real estate choices to drive school choice. And then disadvantaged or kids that don't have the opportunity to live in a better neighborhood, if they have poor schools, they just have to go there. Real quick on the empirical outcomes of school choice programs. When you look at, and this is true actually for charter schools as well, when you look at kind of the gold standard studies where they've actually done random assignment and they've placed kids in voucher programs or private school programs and public school programs and compared the outcomes, there has been, the majority of the studies have positive effects and that includes things like academic outcomes for the kids that choose schools. But it also, 22 studies show that the competition leads to positive academic outcomes for the kids that remain in the public schools. And Carolyn Hawksby, who is a researcher in the education movement, 
she always has said that competition lifts all boats in education. And certainly at Reason, we in our public school choice center, where we look at just public funding that follows the kid within a district like Denver or Hartford or San Francisco, the minute that you have incentives and the money is attached to the kids, even in a purely public school system, people start to change their behavior and there's positive outcomes. But overall, the empirical outcomes for school choice have been good. And even when you hear negative research about charter schools, if you look at the methodology, the better studies do show that charter schools have improvements for kids. And specifically, when you look in geographic areas like New Orleans, Los Angeles, Detroit, where there's a mass of charter schools and they have market share, where they're really competing with the public schools, they tend to outperform the traditional schools. The charter school movement is where we've seen the most growth in school choice. There's been 100% growth since 2007. We actually now have about 2.9 million students in charter schools. There's 6,700 charter schools in the United States, but 200 charter schools closed in 2015. And out of 6,700 schools total, 200 schools closing, like that seems kind of like a lot, but it's actually a feature of charter schools that if they can't meet their fiscal obligations, if they can't meet their academic obligations, you can actually close a school. And you know, people get upset about, well, what about the disruption to students? But how disrupted is a student that has to go to a school that's been failing for decades? You know, if you take Centennial High School in Compton, which lost its accreditation like 20 years ago, it's one of the lowest performing schools in the country. Decades of kids have gone through that dysfunctional school and it's not gonna close. So that's a positive thing. Um, charter schools really, you know, and depending on how you feel about the bubble in higher education and, you know, college education, but, you know, charter schools have done something. Not only do they show that they can teach kids to read or do math better, but they actually are placing their students in college. And even though, you know, sometimes we're skeptical about college, almost all of the evidence still shows that your lifelong outcomes in terms of quality of life, you know, people stay married longer if they have the college education. So maybe that's, you know, a detriment, I'm not sure. But <laughs> um, it's, you know, they, you have earning potential that's much larger. You know, this is something that, you know, you don't see a lot of urban traditional schools that are, you know, bragging that a hundred, even my kids go to an upper middle class school and I can guarantee you that a hundred percent of the students are not going to college. And then we talk a little about, a bit about market share and I just want to um, talk about New Orleans and use them as a quick case study because New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina in 2005, basically the whole school system shut down and because a lot of local laws, they basically let all of the teachers go and they were able to get out of the union contract and they started from scratch with a public school system. And now, actually this year, the last traditional public school in New Orleans closed and it's the only city in the country where 100% of the kids pick customized schools that are competing with each other. And you know, you wonder why Detroit can't pay its bills. One of the reasons is 55% of its students have left the district to go to charter schools. Um, DC 40 is encroaching on 50% of its students in charter schools. So you have these places where charter schools run by independent operators are giving the district a real run for its money in terms of both individual choices for kids and the academics and the quality of the schools. And then this is just a snapshot of a bunch of charter schools in New Orleans. Um, all of those are different kinds of schools that parents can choose from. And again, one of the things about New Orleans and about the charter school movement is it gets rid of the residential assignment requirement. And parents really can pick any school. But the point about that is not that you want to bus people all over. You know, if you have true neighborhood schools that grow up near you and are high quality, you'll pick that school. You don't necessarily want to have to take three buses and a train to get to a higher quality school. And unfortunately, in some urban areas, 
kids have to go to the suburbs or they have to go far away to find good schools. The point of competition like New Orleans is now everyone does have a higher quality school than five years ago in their neighborhood. And every indicator really shows that New Orleans is improving. Um, the grad rate went from 54% to 73%. 51% of the students are college bound after high school. And there's a typical improvement of 8 to 15 percentile points on reading and math test scores in New Orleans. And actually, Tulane University, which is the next slide, just did a big study. And what they found is that um, if you look, this is basically New Orleans down here on test scores. And this is other districts in um, Louisiana. And now, in, after 2012, New Orleans has actually converged on all of those other districts and they've surpassed actually other Louisiana districts in terms of their student achievement. The Tulane study found a 4% effect size, which is huge in education studies. And that's actually just to give some context for that. Universal preschool and pre-K class size reduction where you have one teacher for 15 students. New Orleans actually has a much larger effect size than a lot of the very popular reforms that people say if we just had preschool or if we just you know, had smaller classes for teachers, students would improve. Um, they also moved to the, from the 25th percentile to the 40th percentile on the ACT, which you know that's a pretty big jump. And then I just want to end with education savings accounts because this is really School Choice 2.0, and it goes more to kind of one way that we might get to a really customized education system. And education savings accounts are the idea that instead of getting a voucher amount or a tax credit scholarship that goes to one school, in the future, maybe you want to you know, take some online classes from Stanford's online high school or you want to go to your local community college and you know, take a couple classes there, and your kid needs a speech therapist. And you know, there's all these different needs that you have. And instead of thinking of like, we have buildings and we have funding and kids go there, that we actually would pay for kids to have an educational experience throughout their lifetime. And that that would look different for every kid. And lots of kids will still use their education savings account, which basically is state and education local funds that go directly to parents. And they go into a bank account, and they can pay for education services. And then that money, if they actually are frugal and save money, can roll over to the next academic year. And maybe they want to spend more money on high school than they do on second grade. Or maybe they want to save it for higher education so that they have a head start to send their kids to college. But that's one way that education is moving, this whole idea. And Nevada actually passed the first universal education savings account. And it actually is the first universal school choice program in the nation that applies to every single kid. So it's interesting that this new idea of an education savings account. And basically, every parent would get $5,000 in Nevada, and they could use that for a private school. They could add their own money to it. They could use it for homeschooling materials, for you know, really anything that the parent wants. And again, the kids still have to um, you know, move along at grade level. I think, I don't know, there's not a testing requirement in the education savings accounts at this, at this point, I don't think so. But, you know, it's the first year of the program, but unfortunately, the ACLU and a bunch of other plaintiffs just actually got an injunction against the first 4,000 kids had signed up. And so they can't try out the Nevada education savings accounts. And it's not the first education savings account program. I think right now there's five education savings account program in the country, and Arizona was actually the first, and they applied it to a certain kind of kid. So if you have special needs, your parents can use your money to customize. And that's a good place to start, I think. And now, actually, there's a huge um, Indian population that has been poorly served in Arizona and ha are very 
low scoring families that have very low performing schools. And so they actually, the entire Indian population has access now in um, Arizona to the education savings account. The bottom line I would just say is that choice is not going away. There's one to two million kids homeschooling. There's you know over two million kids in charter schools. Districts have all kinds of in-district choice programs now where you don't have to go to your residentially assignment school. And as you know, technology makes it easier, right now you can take a full course, you, know, you can teach yourself almost anything online. You can find someone that has developed a curriculum and in many cases for free if you wanted to learn something. And that's definitely going to have an impact, I think, on the future of education. But the deficit right now, and what we're really looking for in the libertarian moment, is that we haven't yet got to the point where someone has found the uber of education or has revolutionized it or radicalized it in some way. I mean, we're still kind of, we're still spending the majority of the 600 billion in the same way that we went to school in the 1970s when I went to school the same way kids went to school really for decades. So we are still kind of waiting in education, but the good news is that we have all this pressure from all sides where parents really do want to customize and individualize their kids' education.